Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 24th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we agree with an Anchorage Daily News editorial that argues Alaska's toughest budget choices are yet to come. Second, we take a look at what's happening with oil prices. Are they sustainable? And what do they mean from the perspective of the Alaska budget? And third, why we believe that as a state and nation, we really need to be paying attention to what's going on with Social Security. And now, let's join Michael. To get the deep dive, go down in the weeds with uh, my friend Brad Keithley, uh, who is the founder and director of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He comes on every week with us to talk about a lot of issues, and today uh, is no different. Every week we discuss his weekly top three, which is the biggest three issues that he has with things that are going on in the state of Alaska and things that are affecting the state of Alaska. And so we jump into it with him now. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing Excuse me, I guess I got a frog in my throat. I'm doing great today. I hope you are as well. I'm not doing too bad. Every day above ground, as my grandfather used to say, is a good day. So, you know, <laughs> if we're not looking at the grass from the wrong side, we are doing good. We're doing good. Uh, so your weekly top three. And uh, I almost dropped my almost dropped my cup of coffee the, this morning when you sent me the uh, what your list was going to be of topics today, because I said, "Hang on, hang on, wait a second. I can't believe that Brad Keithley actually agrees with something from the ADN editorial page. What the actual heck is going on?" Uh, and it's a piece from the actual ADN elect- editorial board, which I just, you know, wow. Uh, so give it, give us, a, give us the rundown here. What is it that you are actually agreeing to, my friend? Yeah, the, it's like the Earth stood still for a second, isn't it? I, yeah. Usually, usually we use the ADN editorial page to take off for things we don't agree with, but they wrote a, a piece, the editorial board. Uh, Tom Hewitt is the editor, and there's three or four others on the editorial board, uh, wrote a piece uh, within the past week. Uh, The piece is titled, Alaska's Toughest Budget Choices uh, Are Yet to Come. And I just found it, it, it's not not taking sides. It's not saying that we ought to, as a result of these things, we ought to favor one candidate or another. It's just a straight-up analysis of, where we are on the budget and and what we face going forward, and and the and the conclusion is that we face that 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 we've seen a lot of tough choices, but we've got more tough choices uh, to go, and that's even with uh, oil prices and production recovering. We'll talk a, a little bit about that in the second segment, but even with that, that we face this, these tough choices going forward, and they boil it down. They boil it down to to, to three things. They said. One of three things or a combination of three things uh, has got to happen. The first is uh, spending cuts that diminish state services deeper than anything Alaskans have yet experienced. Um, and that's right. You and I have talked about um, uh, on, the, on the show how, how much of a budget uh, our, uh, oil, our traditional revenues, oil and, and – uh, other taxes that are about a half billion dollars. Um, the other taxes are about a half billion dollars. Even adding Hammond 5050, that we can only afford a budget of about uh, 3.75 billion dollars, 3.8 billion dollars, 
And and we've also talked on the show about uh, what the legislature actually spent last year, um, or for this coming fiscal year, which is about $4.8 billion, a billion dollars more. Uh, and we've talked about uh, the legislative finance report uh, that says this is the stuff just to hold even. This is the stuff, additional stuff you're going to have to spend um, in the next year, and that's another $200 million. So we're talking about talking about a $5 billion starting point for FY19 against a, a, a revenue base that can sort of support about 3.75 or 3.8. So we're, we're talking about a billion-dollar gap here um, uh, between, uh, between spending levels and, and revenue levels. And, and so when the ADN says one choice, one path is spending cuts that diminish state services deeper than anything Alaskans have yet experienced, they're exactly right. I mean, we're talking about, we, we, think, we think we've cut, people tell us we've cut, uh, but we've got another 20% or so uh, to go uh, to get down to, or well, more than 20% to go to get down to uh, long-term sustainable levels. The second choice is dramatic reduction or elimination of the permanent fund dividend. If we aren't going to close this spending gap by spending reductions, we're going to have to close it in some way. And the way that the legislature led, led from 2016 by the Alaska Senate majority, the Alaska Republic, the Alaska Senate Republicans, the way the legislature has has gone so far is to take it out of the PFD. And you've got people like Natasha von Inhoff and Chris Birch out there saying, well, we'll just take the PFD to zero uh, if we need to, uh, rather than rather than do anything else. Um, we'll try to cut spending as much as we can, but if we can't cut it enough, We'll just take the PFD to zero and fund it, uh, fund it that way. After all, they would say, John Coghill would join in on this. Pete Kelly would join in on this. After all, it's just government money, uh, and the government's just pull it, pulling it back in to help support uh, government. So that, right. the ADN says that that's the second alternative. And then the third alternative is the T word, uh, taxes. Uh, and, 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 and instead of cutting, and instead of filling the gap, uh, with PFD cuts than uh, filling it by taxes, and you know, when I got to the to the end of um, to the end of that piece, I said to myself, "They're exactly right. Those are the three choices." And frankly, they sort of line up with the three candidates we've got out there, right? Uh, to to uh, to some degree or another. Uh, but those are the three choices that we're facing, and none of them are pretty, uh, and all of them, uh, one of them or a combination of the three are going to be absolutely necessary uh, to get us the rest of the way through. We're not going to be saved by oil, uh, as we'll talk about in the upcoming segment. So for those of, for those listeners who haven't read it, uh, it was in the ADN about six days ago. Uh, go to the ADN uh, website, look under opinions, and look for a piece that says Alaska's toughest, toughest budget choices are yet to come. Uh, and as I say, I think I think they've got it exactly right, both in terms of what we're what we're heading toward uh, and what we're going to have to do about it uh, in the next in the next uh, uh, administration in the next four years. I, and I like the fact that it really is kind of analogous to our three choices, not perfectly, obviously, um, because, uh, uh, you know, there's been some wiggle room on Dunleavy on some of his commentary and numbers and things like that. But it is kind of analogous on their overall broader sweeping platforms of what they're saying. Uh, Dunleavy would be with the spending cuts and diminishing state services. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Walker would be probably with the dramatic elimination of the permanent fund, although he does like the T word as much as anybody else. Baggage kind of fills in the gap. They may be swapping back and forth on two and three, but it is kind of, you know, it, it is kind of analogous to these three candidates. Um, let me tell you the one thing that I did not agree with in this piece after reading it um, was I, I – I love the final kind of jab on the way out the door on item number one, the spending cuts, um, because they, you know, they point out that the diminishment of state services would be the potential diminishment could be severe. But again, that is all based on prioritizing the spending and where you're making the cuts and everything else. But the final parting shot out the door on item number one was of note, Alaska is also the only state where more than a thousand dollars of that sum, and they were talking about per capita spending, is being paid directly to residents in the form of the check. 
which, again, treats it as if it is government money, uh, which I think is part of the problem here. We continue to treat this as if it's government funds, that it's not the people's money collectively. And I got into this argument with somebody the other day on Facebook, which I know I say I should never do, but I can't take my own advice sometimes. Um, the guy was talking about, what, are you for socialism? Are you for communism? You believe? And I'm like, look, I didn't write the state constitution. I didn't write the state constitution. I live under it. It is a quasi-socialistic contract at this point because it holds all of our resources in communal, you know, in communal possession. We all own it collectively. It collectivizes the whole thing. I didn't make that rule. I'm living under that rule, and that's what Hammond said at the same time, is that he's spreading, you know, that this was, we all own the wealth collectively, and we should also at least see a share of it instead of having it all go to government. Am I wrong on that? No, you're absolutely right. And Hammond has a great uh, piece on that uh, in Diapering the Devil. He, he, he confronts the issue of whether uh, the PFD is, is socialism, and he says, look, we are, we are taking money that is that is owned collectively, just like just like if you and I held an oil and gas lease in Texas, you and I would share individually in the in the royalties that were produced from that oil and gas lease. Um, and Hammond said, "Look, we all own uh, collectively the uh, the oil and gas uh, uh, the oil and gas minerals. Um, that's what that's what the federal government uh, required as a condition of statehood." Uh, and we are giving that money, taking a portion of that money, uh, and giving it to those who co-own the lease, who are tenants in common um, under the lease. And that is capitalism. It would, what would be socialism is to say, oh, no, government gets all that money. Government controls the money. Government gets to you know, act like the stockbroker that, that, that keeps your money, t- takes your money and keeps your money. Uh, instead of giving it to you. Capitalism is putting that money in the hands of individuals, of citizens, uh, to make choices between uh, various alternatives. And one of those choices they may may vote for uh, is taxes, uh, and then we can tax ourselves in whatever manner uh, we decide. But in the the first instance, that money should go to individuals, uh, and individuals should have have it in their pocket uh, instead of it being in government's pocket. That's what capitalism is as opposed to socialism. Well, anyway, I like the fact that the news miner or the uh, EDN rather lays it out there uh, and, and gives us these three choices. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid that we're going to blink and get to the point to where instead of having enough cuts, uh, because I think we're going to have to cut, and yes, that will have an effect on the economy, and yes, it will be uh, you know, a change to some of the because I fully expl- expect that they will not cut wisely, uh, that they they won't find efficiencies where efficiencies could be found, and so we'll feel the pain because that's the want of politicians is to make you to punish you for making them make cuts. Um, we will probably see some kind of discussion on taxes, um, but I just don't know if it's going to be before or after the election at this point. Um, I, I, we're running out of time for this segment, but I'll give you a chance to respond before we jump into number two. Well, <laughs> it sort of depends on, on whether the candidates come clean, right? I mean, Mike continues to live in this world where, oh, no, we don't have to make big cuts. We do have to make some cuts down to about $4 billion, $4.3 billion, uh, but we don't have to make big cuts. Oil's going to save us. Production's going to save us. Um, and and that enables him to avoid talking about the deeper cuts that the ADN correctly identifies we're going to have to make. And if you just look at the numbers, you realize we're going to have to make. Um, if he comes clean and, and, and gets and starts talking about a realistic number we have to get back, have to, we, we have to get down to, then that should trigger the sort of discussion that the ADN um, uh, sort of foreshadows with this editorial. If he continues to sort of live in this happy world where we don't have to make uh, the the level of cuts we're going to have to make, then maybe we don't get to that discussion. I think we're the poorer for that at that point because we get through an election, we haven't talked about reality, uh, and we get into December and January and February, and then he's trying to grind out these budget cuts, and he hasn't built up, he hasn't taken the opportunity of the election to build up support for that. So I... I 
I hope I hope we had that discussion, but with about you know with forty five days left to go or less, it's not looking like we're getting there. All right. Well, I'm sorry I flapped my lap too much there. We're going to have to jump uh, jump away. We're going to come back with items number two and three right here on the Michael Duke Show. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Back with more. Don't go anywhere. We will return in just a moment. Thanks for coming in and joining us right here on your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. But I, I thought it was an important distinction, again, to talk about why it is not the government's money and, uh, and, and why it's not socialism. I mean, really, this is the highest expression of private property rights um, that you could have. I mean, again, you, you pointed out, I've talked about it, most people don't understand that the collectivizing of all the resources in the state of Alaska was a mandate put on the state framers of the Constitution by the federal government. I mean, they said if you you can't ha- you cannot give the mineral rights to the people and the subsurface mineral rights, and that was a, that was a stricture. And I think people don't understand that that's how that was laid out. Yeah, and and Michael, I I, I used to give a speech that that said, you know, do, do we want Alaska to be more like I, I just picked a a, a country because had an A in an Azerbaijan, where where but you can pick I mean you can pick almost any. Uh, a socialist country where where they do have oil or mining or something and it's owned by the government and all the money goes to the government and it's run as a it's a run as a government state do you want do you want Alaska to be more like Azerbaijan or do you want it to be more like Texas what governor Hammond did with uh, with the PFD I it was a stroke of brilliance frankly whoever came up with this idea um, uh, it was just a stroke of brilliance what government governor Hammond did was take a, 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 an economic structure that was designed to look like Azerbaijan, where government got all the money and government decided which industries and which people got, got money because government in the, in the first instance had all the money. Governor Hammond took, took a structure that was set up like that and turned it into Texas through the PFD by, by essentially taking that money, taking a portion of that money, 50% of that money, uh, the earnings off the permanent fund and saying that goes directly to the people and turning it into a system where tenants in common, people who own the resource in common, were each given a share um, of the resource just like happens in Texas. As I said, if you and I owned an oil and gas lease in Texas um, and it started producing royalties, uh, you and I would share in those under Texas law, you and I would share in those individually. Um, and, and Governor Hammond set up some that, that did exactly that. So it's 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 brilliant in in finding a way to turn into a capitalistic structure what government uh, what was set up at the time to be a socialistic structure. Um, if 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 we if we end the PFD, all that money comes back into government. We are no different than Azerbaijan, Angola, uh, any place uh, in the world where the government controls uh, all Nigeria, where the government ends up controlling uh, all of the royalties produced from oil resources. And you look at those other countries, um, and it's uh, it's sort of a disaster. I mean, Norway is, is sort of the exception to that rule, but every place else, uh, those, uh, those, those, those government held, uh, uh, where, the, where the leases produce revenue for the benefit of the government, uh, it's turned into a disaster because government, you know, government is picking the winners and losers, which industries to support, which industries not to support, and we know that that ends up being done done politically, not right. economically. Right. Um, it's who, who who your friends are and what business your friends are in, and you can see some of that in Alaska with re, with respect to construction contracts. So, it's a um, it's a um, uh, very it's a brilliant. The PFD is a brilliant. Uh, uh, structure to take what otherwise would be socialistic and turn it in, turn it into capitalism. Yeah, and it's very frustrating to to have to fight these battles a lot of times with people who, usually uh, ideologically, I would be mostly in agreement with, uh, and unfortunately, they get so blinded by the hatred of the collectivized, you know, the, the, of the collectivized nature of it that they're not seeing the components that you and I are laying out there in that regard, and and I think that that's a that's a shame. That's a real shame. 
Um, do you think that Dunleavy is going to ta- – we got to about a minute here. Do you think that Dunleavy is going to tackle – this um, uh, this issue of the of the budget overall before we hit this the end of this forty five day window. I don't think so. I mean, from what I've seen, uh, some people have used the phrase "run the clock out." That he's trying to run the clock out. Uh, I think he. I think they've made the political decision in that campaign a wrong one. I wouldn't have made it, but I think they've made the political decision in that came campaign. To, to avoid talking about the type of cuts that they're that they're going to have to make if Mike's going to achieve restoring the PFD without without taxes. And they've done that for a political reason. They don't want to have to confront talking about cutting the, the, the university system or cutting Medicaid or cutting K-12 through because they would generate them. They would activate the support systems to those uh, um, to those spending categories. Thank you, Brad. Hold on a second. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty Based, Free Thinking Radio. Continuing now our discussions with Brad Keithley, who is the director and founder of Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. It's an organization dedicated, well, to creating sustainable budgets here in the state of Alaska, which is something that we've struggled with in this state since basically inception, since the statehood. I mean, since we got that first royalty payment and they spent it like drunken sailors. Uh, ever since then, we've had a hard time coming to grips to what we do with all this money. And, of course, uh, the rest is history. Brad joins us now again. We were talking about his weekly top three. We only made it through number one, though, in the first segment. So we're going to have to concise down here into uh, number twos and threes. Brad and I always have a problem with that. Um, so, Brad, let's talk about uh, let's talk about number two, which, of course, is the price of oil. We're seeing a surge. Where does it take us? Well, Michael, one of the things I have on my phone is a, is an up to date oil price uh, oil price widget, uh, so I always can check the price of oil. And right now, as we speak, the price is eighty two dollars eleven cents. That's Brent, uh, Brent uh, which uh, uh, Alaska most uh, uh, is like. We're Alaska's probably a little bit off of that, but we should be above eighty dollars for Alaska right now uh, as well. And that's those are price levels we haven't seen since twenty fourteen. Two things are driving it. One is fundamentals. Um, we have uh, demand has, for oil has continued to increase, um, uh, in, in, in part spurred by lower prices. Uh, but, but the industrial activity that, that's been going on worldwide uh, has increased uh, demand for oil. Uh, coming out of the 2014, coming out of the price uh, drop that we had from 2014 to uh, 2017, uh, we have we have had a lack of investment uh, in in new projects, and as a consequence, supply uh, has been off. Uh, adding to that, uh, on a on a on a fundamental basis, is Venezuela, who uh, has the largest amount of oil reserves in the world, larger in, in terms of reserves, larger than even Saudi Arabia. Um, Venezuela's uh, production has dropped dramatically as a result of sort of the disintegration of that country. Um, and, so, and so the supply, demand has been up, supply has been down, and that fundamental has driven uh, a significant part of the, of the resurgence in oil prices. But what's going on now and what, and what sort of drives oil when it gets, it gets closer to the supply-demand balance is sort of the news of the moment. Uh, and, and what's driving oil right now is is the, the talk about what's going to happen when the U.S. sanctions against Iran uh, are going to kick in uh, in November, in just in, in a short period of time here. Um, and those sanctions essentially say that if you that the countries that deal in the dollar or deal with U.S. banks or in somehow in some way touch the U.S. Uh, that that they will be sanctioned by the U.S., not permitted to do that, if they continue to buy Iranian oil. So the market for Iranian oil is starting to drop. You can't, if you touch Iranian oil, uh, you're going to be subject to those sanctions. Um, and as a consequence, ir- the Iranian oil is starting to come off the market, it's sort of like the Venezuelan oil, uh, but for a different reason. The oil's there. Uh, but but people uh, customers can't are concerned about touching it because of the effect of U.S. sanctions. 
And then you add on top of that uh, uh, news of the, of the moment. You have an outage in Nigeria. Nigeria, for example. You have a strike in Norway. Uh, various news developments that occur, um, and and they will run up oil or down. Just a couple of weeks ago, oil was threatening to go below seventy dollars. It was down in the low seventies, uh, and and at that time, all the talk was about. You know the potential that oil was gonna was gonna plunge below that. Now that Iran is sort of getting a little bit closer, uh, oil's coming back up. President Trump has called on Saudi and other countries to produce more uh, to bring supply up to help moderate that uh, that 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 spike in oil prices. Um, and there was an announcement this week that by OPEC and Russia. Who have who who also has a lot of production and sort of acting in cooperation with OPEC now coordination with OPEC that they were not going to to increase supply that they were going to let they were going to let this sort of price hike uh, go on for a while so the fundamentals have driven oil prices up but what's really causing oil now to approach and break through eighty dollars and hover around eighty dollars uh, are the is this news of the moment. You can't always count on you can't count on that news of the moment to sustain long term to sustain you know the segment of prices that that it's carrying uh, when the news of the moment is oh Venezuela is coming back up or the Iran sanctions aren't going to be as tough because nations like China are going to take that and 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 production that otherwise is going to go to China is going to be available to the world. Uh, when that sort of counter news starts showing up, prices will come back down uh, into the $70 range. So from Alaska's standpoint, we shouldn't be saying, oh, it's through 80. Now, we, now we're going to look forward to, you know, it, we've, we've sort of got that in the bag. We know we're going to have 80. Now it's going to go to 90. Now it's going to go to 100. Happy days are here again. That is something we should not even be close to talking about among ourselves because it's just it, – it's this this – Oil price at this level is just being driven by too many temporary things that could turn around and, and go south and drive it back down toward the seventy dollar range. And again, it's a, a temporary hike. I think that's the that's the crux of what you're saying, driven by factors that are very volatile. Which again is another reason why we should, you know, having a whole economy based on a volatile commodity like oil is uh, is always iffy. And and since we're not living conservatively in the state of Alaska on that oil money, uh, we're going to pay the price on it. and We're going to continue to uh, be bumped around by it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it reinforces a point that you and I talked about a few weeks ago, which is the role of the Constitutional Budget Reserve. We've drained the Constitutional Budget Reserve. We have less than two uh, uh, a billion dollars left in the constitutional budget reserve from a high of of 14 at one point. We've taken it down. We've, we've drained 12 billion dollars out of it. That's sort of our fiscal uh, holding tank, if you will. It's it's there to be used during bad times, and we need to refill it during good times. Uh, and and these prices, the the temporary nature of these prices, I think to me. Um, uh, emphasize again why we need to refill the CBR because if we if we if we start predicating budgets on these price levels and then they drop again we don't have anything to fall back on right so right. anymore because we because we drain the CBR so we need to be using the opportunity of these higher prices and the opportunity of higher production uh, to refill the CBR uh, before we start doing anything else because you never know. Venezuela somehow may recover, uh, uh, Iran may come to the table, the sanctions may be off, and all of a sudden we're not only talking about seventy dollars again, we're talking, we're starting to talk about oil in the sixes again. So it's um, it, it 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 not only is is a cautionary tale about don't predicate your budget on these higher prices, but do what you need to do to get the CBR refilled while we're while we're enjoying the benefit of these higher prices. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. That puts number two in the bag. Uh, don't trust the oil prices being high forever. That's the that's the moral of that story. Number three, of course, is uh, don't believe everything they tell you. Social Security, again, we continue to see downward numbers. we got about four minutes here, Brad. Well, Social Security is one of those issues, if I ever get bored during the day and, uh, and want to generate some discussion, 
all I have to do is put Social Security, a, a comment on Social Security out on the out on Facebook or out on social media, and I get all this all this discussion going on. People misunderstand Social Security. Uh, the payments that, that I made, the payments that others have made in the baby boomer generation uh, over time through our payroll taxes and otherwise into Social Security aren't enough to pay to, to pay out the benefits. They haven't built up enough of a reserve to pay out the benefits as we hit retirement. A portion of, of the payments we made went to support people that were retired before us, people from the greatest generation. A portion of the payments we've made, or the, the remainder of the payments we've made, have not been enough to build a reserve to take care of us in retirement. As baby boomers move through and have this giant wave of retirees, and as importantly, as people live longer, as retirees live longer, we've stretched those reserves, those Social Security reserves, to the breaking point. The projection currently is that we run out of the reserves um, in, uh, in the early 2030s. Uh, and what will happen at that point is Social Security benefits will drop dramatically down to the level that they can be supported by the taxes, then being the payroll taxes, then being paid by millennials uh, and Gen Xers. Um, and that's a drop of something like 27, 28 percent that occurs in the early 2030s. Frankly, I think that number, I think that the, 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 the expiration date uh, is going to move closer to us because we've seen these huge steps um, in, in life expectancy among retirees. And as the baby boom, as medical science continues to advance, as the baby boomers can stay more healthy, as they come into retirement, I think we're going to see that life expectancy number continue to move, and that will, that will drain uh, the Social Security benefits uh, trust fund sooner uh, and, and, and move that, that, that witching hour closer, in, move it into the 2020s. We need to be solving this problem now. While some of the baby boomers are still working and still can pay higher payroll taxes, which frankly is part of the solution, and still can prepare a little bit for reduced benefits, somewhat reduced benefits, which is part of the solution as well. This, if we don't pay attention to this problem now, if we just let it go to the expiration date, the tax burden, the increased tax burden uh, on those that are remaining in the workforce, the Gen Xers and the Millennials in the workforce at that point, is going to be huge. And the benefit drop, uh, the portion that's going to be the benefit drop that, that, that's going to affect retirees, the baby boomers that are in retirement, is going to be huge as well. Yeah. So and the way, there are th things you can do, but we've got to start dealing with it now. And unfortunately, we've got to start dealing with the clock. Boy, we are just a slave to that ugly, ugly clock, aren't we? Uh, Brad, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I'm, I, I'm going to give you an egg timer. I got one minute, and uh, and boy, we just we can we can burn that minute up in no time flat. Um, so I want you to give a chance here to the Facebook audience since we got about a six minute break here at the top of the hour. If you want to finish those thoughts on Social Security, I'll tell you, I plugged my name into the system. Uh, at uh, the uh, Citizens for Responsible Budgets, and um, and uh, I, you know, I, at sixty five uh, is uh, I I I come the, I, I'm like right at the year. That's the year that everything goes to hell. And they said that in my uh, in my uh, my generation we will have at least a twenty four twenty three twenty four percent reduction in. Uh, Social Security benefits, which is in in my lifetime a hundred thousand dollar cut over any benefits that I would have received, it's a significant chunk, and that's just the beginning. If these numbers don't change, I mean that's just today's numbers, and these are changing yearly. Yeah, and that's just Social Security. Medicare uh, has the same issue. In fact, Medicare hits its its expiration date earlier than Social Security does. So not only in your lifetime. Uh, if we don't get this thing fixed, not only do you hit that reduction in um, uh, uh, in your Social Security payout, but your Medicare uh, co-payments or or the or the quality or or, or quantity of care that you're going to get through Medicare goes down, uh, and 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 as a consequence, to achieve uh, the same sort of outcomes, you're going to have to pay more uh, on your on the healthcare side. Uh, and believe me, those health care costs go, start going up the, the older you get. So it's, it's, a, it's a double whammy. And, and the problem, Michael, the reason I keep coming back to this 
is is my generation, the, the baby boomer generation, just wants to stick their head in the sand. They want to say, oh, no, we paid all our entire lives. We paid payroll taxes our entire lives. Um, and so we're entitled to this. Don't you dare talk about, you know, cutting benefits. Um, uh, government must have stolen the money or there must be some some horrible thing that's gone on. Uh, uh, but we're, we're due those benefits and don't you dare talk about, you know, benefit cuts or don't you dare talk about, uh, payroll tax increases. Well, guys, we got to talk about that or, or, or when we hit, when we hit the expiration date on these two trust funds on Medicare and on, uh, and on, uh, uh, social security, it's going to be hell to pay. I mean, uh, there's a huge number. I, I forget the statistic right off the top of my head. But well more than 50% of retirees rely on Social Security for more than 50% uh, of, of their income in retirement. You take 25% out of that, you take a quarter out of that, and you're starting to, to really affect the quality of life that seniors and others in retirement are going to – and others as they hit retirement uh, are going to have. There are, there are solutions to this, but, but the sooner we start, on getting to these solutions in terms of uh, uh, changing the benefits somewhat to reduce the cost or increasing payroll taxes to, to, to build up a, um, uh, a bigger trust fund, the sooner we get started on those, the lower they're going to be. If you, don't, if you don't do that now and you wait until we crash and burn, as I said on the air, the, the, the level of payroll, payroll taxes, the hike we're going to have to do in payroll taxes or the cuts we're going to have to do uh, in Social Security benefits is going to be huge because we're going to be out of time. We will have moved the entire baby boomer generation through the work period into retirement, and we won't have them any longer to help uh, contribute to the cost. They're just all going to be takers uh, of the benefits. Right. And, and so it's 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 imperative to get off the dime and start working on this now. If 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 I think if you ask Maya. Or if you ask Maya McGinnis, or if you ask ask me, or anybody else who deals with these issues, what's the number one federal issue that that keeps you up at night, that gives you nightmares? It's where we're headed on Social Security and Medicare. And uh, Harold makes the ironic comment. He said, "You know, of course, the baby baby boomers will be the ones that'll call for socialism to protect their to protect their retirements in the end." Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's really a mess. Final thoughts here, Brad Keithley. Well, there, there are, there are good things we can do on this. There are good things we can do on, on other issues, but we have to be realistic. I think the, the theme of today is realism. The ADN article on, on what the alternatives are, we have to be realistic about those. We have to be realistic about oil prices. You just can't start banking on 80 plus dollars going forward. And we have to be realistic on Social Security. We have to, we, we stop, we need to stop burying our head in the sand and we need to become realistic about fiscal matters because um, they're real things uh, and they have real consequences if we don't pay attention to them. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. As always, my friend, it's good to speak with you. Thank you so much for coming on board. Folks can find links to the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page at the top of this this uh, broadcast here on Facebook. And, of course, uh, I posted the uh, article that uh, Brad was speaking about earlier in the chat room. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Brad, for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's good stuff. It's uh, always good stuff. Brad Keithley. Uh, Alaska's for Sustainable Budget. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.